Dr. Al Labrie is an associate professor in the Department of International Health, Global Disease Epidemiology Control, has a joint appointment in the Department of Epi and now studies human populations, uh, and is particularly known for his work in mHealth, and he's the founding director of, I want to get this right, uh, the Johns Hopkins University Global mHealth Initiative, uh, which is a multidisciplinary consortium and has been working with a lot of different projects and people all over the world with a lot of different students here. Um, I have many more things I could say, but um, I think oh. I'll just leave it to uh, Dr. Labrique. Um, this is going to be very hands-on, uh, interactive, uh, maybe slightly dangerous if that thing takes off and flies in unknown directions, um, but really is here to talk about new technologies um, in the field of so mHealth uh, and what their applications might be, and I emphasis on might, in the uh, context of humanitarian response because as he often talks about, there's a lot of what he calls or maybe generally is referred to as vaporware, stuff that looks good but doesn't really perform very well in the field. So it's on that cautionary note but also with an optimistic note that we may be able to do something better via new technologies than we're doing now. But Alan. Thanks so much. Um, so it's always a pleasure to give uh, this lecture in, in uh, this class. And there's a few familiar faces, and, and I think you, those of you who I recognize will not have seen uh, many of these slides before, because this is a completely different topic. The, the ex exciting thing, I guess, I would start with is what five or six years ago, when, when we start, first started introducing this topic in this class, was considered vaporware is now realware. And, and so what's been really exciting in this space is watching things that we imagine actually come to fruition and, and, and uh, actually be implemented in the field. And so that, it's that sort of um, progression from crazy idea to could it work to actually let's try it out and generate some evidence and then actually uh, using this technolo these technologies as status quo. So um, with that in mind and, and some of the, uh, I would say the, the evolutionary progress that we've made over the past few years, I went back and, and largely overhauled uh, this talk to include uh, emerging evidence around the things that really do have an impact in the global health space. Now, speaking of things that you imagine and then come to fruition, like I'm a big, those of you who, who know me, who have worked with me, know the, how big of a geek I am. And uh, you know what better way to start than with the, the, the master of all geeks, uh, Gene Roddenberry, who 60 some years ago conceived of this technology that uh, Commander Spock is holding in his hand, right? Who knows what that is? What's that called? What's this, what's this device? Tri tricorder, right? It was a tricorder. Phenomenally futuristic device which you know, people thought would be actually manufactured in the 23rd century. Can you guys imagine a device that would allow you to communicate over long distances, that would allow you to look up information in the palm of your hand, that would allow you to scan things and understand sort of the health of a patient or an animal or an alien, to do vital signs recording, to do things, something as crazy as heart rate on your, on your handheld device? Well, here we are, not even near the 23rd century, and every single one of you in this class has a tricorder in your pocket, right? And so it's that reality which I think is, is really very exciting. Um, those of you who are, who are you know, in the same uh, proud family of, of Uber Geek, you're welcome to come to my office and hold a real tricorder because I actually have one uh, in that office. But a couple of years ago, Hopkins uh, undergrads and, and the grad school team were finalists in what was the, the, uh, the Qualcomm uh, Tricorder X Prize, which was really pushing uh, engineers around the country and around the world to build a handheld device that could, oh, new version of Java, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> Thanks, Bill Gates. Um, so 10 conditions that had to be diagnosable by these, this palm held device. So you can imagine, this is, this is quite a challenging, um, you had to select three of these elective conditions and all of these core conditions on that handheld device. So, so we're looking at a, at a reality that, that's, quite, uh, that's quite phenomenal. Now, what does this have to do with the kinds of situations that, that many of us work in? And a few weeks ago, I was in rural Liberia 
And as we were looking at these village huts where there was no electricity, no running water, barely functioning health system, I noticed that on the walls of these mud huts were etched numbers. And I started to ask whether this was some kind of census or some kind of a uh, malaria prophylaxis uh, orientation number. But in fact, these numbers were the cell phone numbers of the individuals living in that, in that home. So they had chosen to use their phone number as a marker of identity that people could connect with them despite the fact that this was a, an electricity free zone. And we've seen this in country after country, places where electricity uh, penetration is on the order of 20, 30 percent, but mobile ownership or mobile access is upwards of uh, 80 or 90 percent. So uh, really, when you, when you sit in a boardroom in a place like this and you wonder, oh, this surely is not possible, I would challenge you to ask that question to yourself again and go and understand um, what the situation is on the ground. And some of the things I'm going to share with you in a moment um, really will underline that. Sometimes the innovations that we see in the field are really miles ahead of the sta status quo in the conditions we, we live in here in, uh, in the West. For example, how many of you know what, what this is? And actually, I have one right here, so I'll pull it out and show you. Because unless you see it, you really don't appreciate. Right? What is this? Micro SD card, right? 64 gigabytes. Okay? So that is hundreds and hundreds of hours of full screen video footage that in villages across rural South Asia, Bangladesh, India, these are being exchanged at the local tea stall. Why? Data Not data transfer, kind of data transfer. Bollywood movie transfer, right? <laughs> so you can exchange for a few dollars uh, a micro SD card loaded up with all the latest bootleg uh, Bollywood and Hollywood movies, but imagine the potential of this thing to disseminate information, which a decade ago was the privilege of a small proportion of these populations where we work, whether it's in South Sudan or, or uh, you know, uh, Zimbabwe or, or, uh, or Bangladesh. You know, having access to information is a really powerful uh, change in paradigms. And you look at the parts of the world that have been really affected largely by humanitarian emergencies and disaster. I mean, this is where I was born, so I can tell you this is one disaster, but um, there were certainly, uh, Bangladesh is one of the most resilient countries in terms of the number of floods and, and natural emergencies that it's experienced. But when you look at how the connectivity landscape has also mirrored that disaster landscape. We see across Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, this is just a fraction of Facebook connections illustrated on a map. There are no political boundaries drawn. And what you see is how the entire globe basically is starting to light up with those connections. Now this is Facebook. Facebook is what I would call a tip of the iceberg technology. You need to have a smartphone, you need to have an application running, you need to have a data package. So if this is what's happening with Facebook, just imagine what's going on with voice and text messaging and basic uh, phone connectivity in these same populations. And this was a, a, a famous slide from back in 2013 when the ITU, the UN agency tasked with monitoring the state of global connectivity, reported that there were nearly as many phone connections on this planet as there were human beings on the earth, right? Now we have far exceeded that. There are more phone connections than there are human beings on the planet. So this is the reality that as students of public health, as students of this class, you need to be challenging yourself to think about how do I leverage this new ubiquitous connectivity to accelerate the work that, that I'm planning to do. What is this? Any Midwesterners out there? Yeah, maybe another picture. Uh, yeah, so what is, what is this? Tornado warning, Tornado warning uh, horns, right? Air, air sirens. So across the Midwest, across the parts of the country in the US where tornadoes are frequently uh, experienced, you'll see these objects on pillars around communities to warn people about in, impending uh, natural emergencies that may occur. But this has long been supplanted over the past decade with 
air, air, air raid sirens in, the po in your pocket, right? So, so most people who live in these areas now have um, tornado warning apps. And even, even now through broadcast uh, text message, you get these kinds of warnings. So in the US, this kind of mobile innovation has really uh, uh, supplanted the, the previous uh, status quo. And, and there are numerous examples over the past decade of my favorite one was this one example from a, uh, a church in the Midwest where they were all going in for uh, Sunday morning services and everyone's phones started to go off, one after another. So they all looked, picked up their phones because it was, it was a mini air raid siren sort of in their pockets and then they, they saw that it was a warning and they, they took shelter. The church was completely obliterated by the tornado that went through and not a single person was injured thanks to this, uh, this kind of uh, mobile warning. So, so really uh, exciting potentials that, um, that actually now the, the National Weather Services issues typically over, um, over, mess, over text messaging. So from tsunami, tornado, wind, hurricane, typhoon, flash flood, et cetera. Um, it makes you grateful you're not living in the Midwest sometimes, because boy, that's a lot of natural disasters. This just came out from a report from uh, UNHCR. And I'll let this sink in for a minute here. You may have already seen this graph. I'm not sure if uh, Paul has already shown it to you. Yeah. But here we have uh, three axes, rural, urban, and total, okay? And you've got 3G coverage, which is sophisticated data transmission, 2G, which is basically phone and a little bit of uh, text messaging, and no coverage. Look at the penetration or capacity of mobile network coverage in areas where you have high refugee uh, populations versus what we would consider the, the norm in the global population, right? So we have a widespread penetration of, even in a rural, rural areas, widespread penetration of 2G and 3G um, and slightly more uh, disconnectedness than you, we might expect to see um, in a population at large. So is this an opportunity for working with migrant populations, for displaced populations? Certainly it's something that has not escaped the attention of major normative bodies like UNHCR. So just a, a few months ago, they released this report. So when you, when you, when you guys look at your online slides, and I want to congratulate you guys, because this, this is one of the few classes where I don't see everyone staring at their screens. Um, so it's really great to have eyeballs. And, and those of you who are sharing your screens, I'm, uh, that's fine too, but it's, it's also nice to see your eyeballs once in a while. Um, but you can kind of go to the link and, and read through this because they've really done a, a fairly exhaustive job of looking at, uh, at this reality. Another very sobering statistic, when they asked in the survey that they, uh, they report in this, in, this, uh, in this manual, how often have you observed situations in which refugees prioritized paying for connectivity over the following wants and needs, right? Paying for connect, paying, first of all, right? For connectivity over clothing, personal hygiene, household items, food, water, climate uh, conditioning, right? So it, it is seen as now a, a basic driver of, of what uh, people will, will sacrifice in order to have connectivity to communicate with, with friends and family when they are displaced. So I think, you know, when we think about the challenges of using technology in these kinds of contexts, it's really this, this, this wonderful triangle that they put together in this report. Thinking about the usability of the technology, right? Is this technology appropriate for the context where I'm currently working? What is the availability of the infrastructure or the infrastructure, as I'm going to introduce in a second, and then what's the affordability of this solution, both from the beneficiary's perspective, but also from the agency's perspective, if the one who's may, may be working to uh, deliver uh, care or deliver services using this technology. And you can see they've, they've come up with this benefits cycle, right, in terms of um, the perceived and real benefits that, that uh, refugees, in this case, experienced from engaging with uh, connectivity, co connected devices. So you have well-being and self-reliance, access to information, ability to communicate, innovations in service delivery, whether it's uh, reminding people to take their medication, reminding people to come in for certain follow-up services, uh, follow-up on test results, 
but also in terms of security. Because one of the, the hallmark early innovations that has used mobile technologies um, for health was in tracking uh, reportable events. So whether it's tracking an outbreak or in the case of the, the, the Kenyan election several years ago, I'll show you an example in a moment, um, incidents of election fraud, incidents of violence, incidents of, um, of uh, I use say in English, uh, threatenings, right? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, when you're being threatened by police or by, uh, I'm sure there's an intimidation, thank you. I'm on my way to Bangladesh, and so I sometimes lose my, uh, my English. Um, and you can see the reality on the ground is, is, is fairly messy, right? You're looking at, at haphazard uh, technology, makeshift technology solutions that are put together to adapt to the circumstances. I love this picture of the, the charging stations, because I've seen this in so many places, even not in emergency settings, where it's a great pop-up business, right? If you have 80% uh, connectivity in this area and people looking to get charge on their cell phones um, this is a great way to, to establish revenue from a car battery so you invest in a car battery and now you can charge cell phones and you can earn income uh, even in a very uh, and this is sort of inside of a refugee camp you can see the, the makeshift uh, shelter um, but you know as you think about that 2g to 3g continuum so it's, G refers to generation, right? Second generation, third generation. We're now talking about in the US, fourth generation um, uh, uh, mobile connectivity, which is a, a whole different layer of uh, features. But you're talking, you can see here this continuum of the kinds of basic versus sophisticated uh, services that you can deliver or expect to get from these various, uh, these technologies. Now, this is where my M skeptic hat comes in, and I ask myself, you know, let me take these anecdotes with a pinch of salt. But those of you who are in our global disease uh, programs and policies course, we talk a lot about the power of anecdotes and the power of telling a story about a human being to make the point of a technology or a new innovation actually having a potential. So is there data to back up all of this? I would ask you guys to actually push push back and, and look through the evidence base. But in many cases, one of the things that, that I've been frustrated by as, as, a, as a policy advisor is we like to make policy, we like to make decisions based on evidence, right? But in a lot of these very dynamic and creative uh, environments, you have people adopting innovations in response to a very clear need that they have on the ground but without the time or leisure to actually capture data about that innovation. So you see these innovations diffuse throughout the way people do a certain thing, but they don't necessarily capture the data in a way that we would like them to do, or let alone write about this, right? So if you go to the published literature and you start looking for uh, mobile phone refugee um, or drone mapping refugee, you're not going to find a lot um, in the peer reviewed literature. Although I will say it is, it is improving, thanks to folks like yourselves who go out there and contribute that back into uh, the scientific literature. So let's take a quick look at you know, Julian's story here, as, as UNHCR put it. Before connectivity and after connectivity. I'm not going to read these to you because I know you've already read this faster than I can read it to you. But you can, you can understand the, the, the adaptations that connectivity provide in terms of being able to access information being able to communicate with others, and being able to uh, be more self-reliant and informed about the risks and, and communicate those risks with, with other, others in this environment. But it's not just on the demand side. We're not just talking about you know, mobile connectivity in the hands of the recipients of, of uh, support and aid, but we're also talking about the, the supply side, right? Because now you're talking about connectivity in the hands of providers, right? giving mobile connectivity to, uh, for example, here's a, a Tali story, a UNHCR field worker, and now you can see the ways in which you know, a provider can use technology to connect with those she is there working for, right? In terms of providing them information, giving them access to uh, hotline services, using online incident reporting, all of these different dimensions that open up new possibilities. And so, you know, we're going to look at a couple of videos, and what I'd like you to do 
and we don't have pens anymore or paper, but notepads or whatever writing implement you have, clay tablets. Start to, to I want you guys paper, to, what's that? I have some paper. paper. Not many people have seen this, <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating. He's very archaic in this way, so every once in a while he reintroduces me to these things. Paper, wow. <laughs> Amazing. Um, but I want you guys to be thinking about, you know, what are the, the, the functionalities of technology that either are being communicated as desirable vaporware or pragmatic in terms of uh, actual implemented uh, programs, and we'll talk about that. I like to summarize these as, as these three words, right? We talk about um, connecting, compressing, and creating, right? Connecting people in places where you would otherwise be largely disconnected from each other or from uh, the, the, the people that you're trying to uh, work with. Compressing time is really the fundamental mantra of public health, right? Everything we do largely is about reducing the time between a diagnosis and treatment between identifying a serious in issue that needs attention and responding to that issue, right? So using mobile phones as a way of compressing that, that time and then creating these windows of opportunity where you may not have had before the ability to, to um, disseminate educational information to large groups of individuals, to disseminate alerts like we saw in the example with the tornado warning. These are new opportunities that are introduced by uh, this technology. And around the world over the past decade, we have recognized that there are many different flavors of M health or digital health. And that's, that's sort of a big take home message that I'd like you guys to, to be thinking about is this is not one monolithic intervention. It's not a vaccine for uh, disease X, but it is a strategy that uses those channels of compression, creation, and uh, connection to achieve these different objectives, whether it's surveillance and data capture at the point of emergency, whether it's managing uh, your systems such as supply chain management, or whether it's communication and training functions that allow you to connect with your workforce once they've, uh, they've been released into the field. One of the things that, uh, that we published a few years ago was sort of an ingredients list and so as you, you look at this ingredients list, we're, gonna, we're going to actually think about which ingredients are shown to us as we go through a number of these uh, examples. So behavior change, sensors and diagnostics, vital events tracking and so forth. These are the ingredients that many digital health uh, strategies use to put together their, um, their intervention. But it's also important in these situations to be thinking about the system, right? whether it's uh, established health program or whether it's a humanitarian emergency, you have to be thinking about the digital tool as part of an entire ecosystem of support that has to be thought through. Whether it's the availability of transportation, mobility, cash flow and finances, which can be facilitated by the mobile phone, but if those resources aren't in the background, mobile money, how many of you have heard of mobile money? How many of you have used mobile money to do transactions? I see it. So where, where have you used mobile money? I've used it in Kenya and Ghana. Okay, in Kenya and Ghana. So M-Pesa, right, in Kenya? Yeah. So it's this idea that you can transfer um, assets, mo monetary assets, over a secure uh, text message encrypted with a password that you have put money into an account and then I can transfer money without it being uh, interrupted. In fact, when USAID introduced uh, mobile money into Afghanistan several years ago um, to pay government health workers, everybody thought they were getting a 20% pay raise because each of the bills that was being skimmed off the top as people were transacting hard cash was now being transacted as a single packet and nobody was able to, to take a souvenir off the top of that, uh, that wad. So uh, it, it's... Uh, it's quite interesting. And so across these layers of the health system, whether you're talking about client support interventions, provider interventions, or health system interventions, there's a whole range of these different ingredients that I shared with you a minute ago that can target these different actors within that uh, ecosystem. So this is something to be thinking about 
you don't necessarily have to do just one thing, but as you look at the landscape of challenges and problems that you're facing in a particular situation, which of these ingredients, systemic provider or client ingredients, will you be putting together as a package of interventions for this particular situation? So we're going to take a quick minute and watch. Let me see if this, uh, this works. <laughs> Here, I'll lower it down. So this was a, a, a vision that was put together by the US, uh, US uh, Emergency Response Corps um, in the military to, to garner funding for innovations in their space. And what they used this, this uh, disaster response as a, um, as a vehicle for communicating that need. It's odd they called it the Mole Project, which I think in this administration would probably not go over very well. But uh, let's take a look. And what I'd like you to do is pay attention to the features that they are enumerating as, as useful to that particular population demographic. Despite all the training, nothing can fully prepare you for responding to a disaster. Every scenario is different, and the call can come at any time. But wouldn't it be helpful if you could access the latest information and relevant references before you deployed? And wouldn't it be great if that access was at the tip of your fingers? When a society crumbles, when nothing works anymore, simply gathering information can be a challenge. But imagine having the ability to record critical information, even when you weren't connected to a network, so that information could be shared with your team the minute you were connected. Sometimes the problem lies with language and culture, and we can feel helpless trying to care for those in need. But we can overcome many of these barriers if we had a range of tools available to help us communicate more clearly. With so many agencies involved, resources can be scarce in one corner, and overflowing in another. But imagine if you could identify other medical responders and coordinate activities simply by lowering your eyes. From preparation to being on the ground to the transitional period, the growth in mobile technologies has given us the chance to exchange knowledge on a massive scale, transforming how we work and learn. The Mobile Learning Initiative is building tools to enable learning, collaboration, and information sharing. So how many folks in the room have used your smartphones as a translation device when you've traveled? Right? And this has now become, and, and if you have a, how many of you have an Apple Watch? So Apple Watch has this, has this real-time translator app that you can actually install where you actually speak in your language and it will translate and translate back in real time. So we're getting really, really close to that Star Trek uh, future vision. Um, is this permanent? No. Good. <laughs> so what, what, what were some of the things you guys saw as you watched the video? Logistics. So logistics, right? What else? Just yell it out. Cultural barriers. Sorry? Cultural barriers. Cultural barriers. So, so communication, communication and culture. Okay, what else? What was the first thing he, he got on his phone as he was being deployed? So alerts, and what, uh, he got an alert, and, and what else did he receive? On demand, because he didn't have the skills that he needed, he got? Training, right? 
So you can get training. Coordination. Right? Coordination. Right? What else? Data collection. Data collection. Yep. Right? So these are all the different sort of um, aspirational things that we've actually seen in the course of span of time that we've been doing this lecture in this class, we've seen these uh, come to reality. 999. Mobile phones, the internet and social media all have the power to save lives. The Federation's annual report is full of examples, from the use of text messages to deliver hurricane warnings in Haiti, to a computerized barcode system to monitor the distribution of humanitarian supplies in Syria. The old idea of turning on the TV news or listening to the radio has in many ways been replaced by people using a cellular device or something to stay in touch. We know that during the earthquake in New Zealand uh, just this year, a couple of people were located by tweeting where they were trapped in buildings. So this type of thing is now becoming more and more prominent and we are seeing that people are using social media as a way to find information before a disaster and specifically after a disaster. But there are risks. The report talks of what it calls information poverty, the lack of mobile phone and internet coverage in many of the communities most at risk. Humanitarian agencies mustn't make the mistake, it warns, of listening only to those who are connected and excluding those who are not. Digital data collection raises issue of security and privacy and relief efforts that rely too heavily on technology can be vulnerable. So that caveat was something that really I wanted you to also keep in mind, right? Don't be blinded by the, the, the gaps or don't, don't let, let's put it in the, the, the famous words of the, uh, the London subway, mind the gap, right? So keep, a, keep your, your attention focused on where the technology may actually fall short to provide these necessary services. Now, you know, the way I, I, I sometimes do push back on, on these, uh, these concerns is if your solution can improve the situation by 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, if your counterfactual is zero, right, 70 percent is a whole lot better than not doing anything, right? So keep, it's, it's, a, it's a careful balance in, that you have to keep in mind between what is this technology going to do for me versus what is it not going to uh, do for me. Alan, yeah. I mean, one of the biggest problems is, is connectivity. So scan, someone scan this while, uh, while Paul's talking. Yes. Is connectivity. And yeah. So I mean, one of the things that HDR did for the first time is during the refugee migrant crisis in Greece and others is they actually set up um, mobile, mobile connectivity where the, where the refugees and migrants were. Absolutely. But in these big earthquakes or uh, in big situations where everything is overwhelmed, yeah. It's, it's really, really limiting. So, so and that, that's, I, I'll give you an example in a few minutes about um, that, the reality of that challenge in places like Liberia during the Ebola uh, crisis. Um, so technologies are being developed to, to mitigate that precise uh, circumstance. I think there are still functions and features that can work offline. So data collection is one uh, Kate just gave a minute ago where you can use these devices to capture information and then syn synchronize that information at a central uh, you know, wireless uh, uh, hub where all this information gets aggregated. So, so there are still features that are, are attractive even without connectivity, but there's technologies being developed, uh, local area mesh networks, which can over several kilometers establish instantaneous connectivity um, for a short duration. So, so these kinds of solutions that allow, um, how, how, has anyone in the room experimented with these, um, these phone to phone uh, camping, emergency camping devices? So they have, they, you can now download a little device to attach to your cell phone that'll basically make it, turn it into a walkie talkie of sorts. So creating a stronger local area network that you can use to communicate over a few kilometers. So it's that kind of, I mean, you may not be connecting. Bluetooth, where you're able it, to connect, you're, you're doing it with you know, enough people in a, in a radius and you all right. use Bluetooth. So, so it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, other, it's other different things than Bluetooth, which have a wider range, um, but, but that's the, the idea, right, is to, to use uh, devices speaking to each other. So, so yeah. Towers 
Right. Interesting, yeah. And we, we receive the small cell phones. Each one is actually registered. It's not a, like this. Right, not an open network, right, you know, right. The, like the big brick phones. But right. The small phone and uh, the US phone is zero. And uh, you call US, you call within Baghdad, it's as a local call. Right. And it's fully operational in whole Baghdad within two weeks. And then yeah. they, it was a company called MCI. That. And then it, we transition after that to local cell phone service that the government provided after a year. Right. And the similar thing in Lesbos, uh, they have that kind of a, a connectivity terminal. So as, as refugees arrive in, uh, in Greece, they're actually able to connect to uh, an open network and, and use. And the, the, the irony is, in many cases, internet Wi-Fi is as powerful a communication um, network as having cellular connectivity, right? Because many people are using alternative communication uh, channels, such as when you, if you're not making a phone call, what else can you use? WhatsApp. WhatsApp. What else? Viber. Viber. WhatsApp. Skype. Right. These are these are uh, systems that use internet and not uh, mobile networks. Uh, David. Yeah, it's a, it's a. And how do they focus the message to the specific area where the alert is needed? So, so, so great, great question. question. I mean, there's two different <laughs> strategies. For national, national emergencies or emergencies of, of public uh, importance, um, there are standing agreements across all the network providers that agency X, Y, and Z have access to a broadcast privilege. So, in the case of this kind of. Uh, emergency of overwhelming importance, they can exercise that, the access to that channel, which then broadcasts across all of the, the networks. What you can also do is, and this is a little more expensive, is, is um, uh, triangulated, they, it's used largely by marketing agencies, where they can, you can ask the, this mobile phone provider to only send messages to individuals connected to a particular cell phone tower. Right? So if you said uh, downtown Seattle, for example, you could ask whenever someone connects from another, another tower to this tower, I want them to receive a message saying, you know, welcome to the Seattle Harbor District. Uh, stop by Starbucks and you know, get thrown out. Um, <laughs> sorry. But, but uh, you know, there's all of these, these, uh, these different targeted messaging capacities that, that you, can, you can do. Who scanned this yet? Yep, tell me what, what you saw. is in the size of a postage stamp, right? So imagine the capacity, if you're in a, an emergency situation, you can now have a, have a little portable printer and be printing out health records that can be scanned by any device that has a camera on it, so a smartphone. And this is a QR code technology, up to 4,300 characters that can then be encapsulated in this uh, kind of a, a strategy. So, so you know, a few years ago, we had a, a lecturer come in and was talking about the most widely used technology in the, on the battlefield for US military. And nobody in the class could, could figure it out. And the answer he gave us was duct tape and Sharpie, right? Because zero failure rate, you stick the duct tape on the person, and you write whatever message you wanted to write that gets communicated to the next person. Now you can go way beyond Sharpies and actually have uh, a lot more information encapsulated. And this kind of technology is being used for humanitarian emergencies. You can see here the QR code um, on the UNHCR ID, ID badge, where you have a barcode with an identifier, QR code with much more dense information. Um, and and you know, the, the opportunity here is the data is not accessible. It may be, it could be encrypted. So unless you have permission to read that data, 
you won't be you all you would get is a jumble of, of words and and uh, and numbers. Um, but if you have the passkey, then you could decrypt the, the the data and actually see the the health record of that individual. Now, you know some of these may seem complex, but I really want to emphasize to you about the simplicity, right? In these situations, Paul pointed this out and, and, and others as well, in emergency situations, you often don't have the luxury of setting up elaborate systems unless they've been planned and established months and months in advance. So sometimes these, these simple um, opportunities to improve access to information, to allow people to report to you what's going on on the ground, to compress time these are the, the low-hanging fruit that you should be thinking about as you go forth and, and uh, do this. For those of you, how many were in the simulation exercise a couple weeks ago? And did you have access to phones or not? Did you use, did you have, did you have network coverage in West Virginia? Yes, okay. Um, so, so did you use the phones during, this, during your simulations? Yeah? What, what for, tell us. Okay. Okay. So, so they use WhatsApp to create groups to coordinate uh, between the team. So an interesting use of, of, uh, of those cases. And so the WEF, the World Economic Forum, often uh, commissions these kinds of uh, think tank reports every year on cutting edge issues. And this year, the, the report that they put out was aptly mobile technologies in humanitarian emergencies. So it's, it's astonishing, right? So, so in five, five, six years ago, when we started talking about this in this class, a lot of it was future think, only if, think about, dream when, and now these are, these are sort of routine uh, issues that are being discussed at the highest levels of the normative agencies in charge of, of preparedness for humanitarian emergencies. They highlighted these five pillars that were, that were either used widely in the field or had the opportunity to be used. So basic connectivity, we've beaten that horse to death. Cash transfers, we've talked about, right? So the ability to transact uh, money in these kinds of situations. Providing identity, as I mentioned to you, the, the scribbled number on the mud hut, right? Simple example of, of how people use their mobile phone for identity, but also that SIM card registered to you as an individual could, could be a proxy. Again, it's not a perfect proxy because people are sharing phones, selling SIMs. There's a lot of things that, that can go wrong here. It was interesting, access to utilities was seen as, as one potential where people can, can now pay for services, electricity, uh, even you know, connectivity using their, uh, their mobile phone. And then improving dignity, which I thought was a really thoughtful uh, pillar to put in there because the, the, the the element of dignity that's provided to an individual when they are able to access information, read about things, connect to their families from whom they've been removed, it's a very powerful and, and non-negligible human uh, element. Paul? Just again, in terms of the mind the gap or the, um, the problems that we ran into, hmm. even for, the big thing is identity, and we've been working with different, when I was at HCR and then working with WFP at, uh, with biometrics. Hmm. So, our two agencies didn't work at the same time, so we actually had private different companies deal with our biometrics and they were um, copyrighted. So they actually weren't able they to even talk, talk, to each talk to each other. Yeah. And it's, it's a major issue still. And even the other thing that I would just mention is um, even if that UNHCR identity card looks really good, the privacy issues, and particularly the protection of data, um, is still a major issue, and we did an internal evaluation at UNHCR with a, an outside company that really showed all the problems we have, not just we, we sorry, HCR, but also WFP. And it's a major issue of with using this technology is uh, the humanitarians are not up to date, and well, I guess mo most of the world is not up to date, but the amount, the hacking that can go on and the danger when this data gets out, particularly for refugees, is, is quite uh, different. Yeah. And, and I will point out, right, and so, so the, the exciting thing here is we are living through what's known as the Gartner hype cycle. How many of you know the Gartner hype cycle? Anyone? One hand. So the Gartner group, which is a think tank, a domestic think tank that talk, thinks about emerging technologies and adoption of innovations, talks about technology using this trajectory. New technologies are introduced, 
and then you have this rapid peak of inflated expectations, right? Let that sink in for a moment, right? Where you think, oh God, this is going to solve everything, the QR code, Bitcoin, right? And, and then, this actually looks a lot like my Bitcoin account. Um, I think we're somewhere over here where I'm, I'm feeling a little happier, but uh, you know. What, this was a happy time for us, for those of us who bought like a third of a Bitcoin. Um, but what happens is you get to this peak of, of productivity and you identify some of these challenges. You identify the pitfalls, you identify the gaps, that this solution is not going to be the panacea to all of the pains that you've experienced. And then you end up in what's known as the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> but the trough of disillusionment doesn't, is not a, a terminal uh, place because you have then this plateau of productivity. Some of the things that, that end up in the trough remain in the graveyard of innovation. Other things, actually, and that is a real term, by the way, graveyard of innovation. I didn't just make that up. Um, it's great when innovators talk about these terms, you know, they, and they really exist. But some things make it back up. How do they make it back up? Evidence increases, or we start to see some of these problems addressed. Maybe it's better encryption. Maybe it's uh, turning proprietary technologies into open source. And I'm glad you brought up that, that fingerprint scanner thing because this is an example of a device that, that Hopkins has actually been integral in, in helping to uh, develop and design, re-engineering the whole fingerprint scanning paradigm using open source standard technologies. So now in a humanitarian emergency, I can actually enroll someone. I'm not gonna enroll you for real, but just I can walk up to them and ask them for a few uh, name and other identifiers, mash a button, and then have them place their finger, and I capture one or two or three fingers as a biometric. But I use open source technologies. It doesn't store the fingerprint, it stores a, a, a polygon that's based on, so if, if you imagine her fingerprint, right? I'm just gonna mash it up here. But what it does, it locates these, these points and creates a unique, a unique uh, polygon that connects these points in a, in a matrix. So nobody can replicate your fingerprint based on that polygon, but it's actually a secure uh, way. So, so these issues are, are being struggled with and we're trying to push the technologies that deserve to come out, out of that, that graveyard into productive use. And so you know, hopefully this is a, a, a framework that you guys will have seen already in this class, but if not, it's, it's, a, it's one that I, I like to, uh, to put up uh, when we talk about the different phases of a crisis, right? Where you have um, what we do in public health is emphasize this part. And as we learn from things that fail or things that go wrong, we should be feeding back those lessons into this phase so we're more prepared the next time something happens, whether it's a tsunami or whether it's a, 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 a human-made disaster. Um, but you go through this assessment, planning, stabilization, and recovery phase, right? And so during each of these phases, there are different technologies, different solutions that, again, help to improve how you respond to, um, to that system. Actually, I'm, I'm not gonna show that, I don't think. Can you try? See if it, see if it works real quick, because the connectivity wasn't working earlier. So I have a, a story actually. Send a text a alert. Yeah, tell, tell. Speak up so these guys can hear you too, please. Yeah, we're using SIM cards for identity. Yeah. Uh, so in Iraq during the... Um, can you guys hear? Yeah. Sp speak that way. Okay, so in, in Iraq during the civil conflict, when it, the, it was a, a bloodshed between Al-Qaeda and the Iraqi people, so they were trying to fight Al-Qaeda leader from Jordan, Zarqawi. And what happened is that they captured several sub-leaders and then they, they found that there is a phone call coming to each of one of them. They don't know to whom it belongs, but this, ev before every bombing, there is a one phone number that co goes to every leader in every city. Mm. So they thought this may be the leader. Yeah. So they triangulate every bridge in Iraq to that SIM card they found a location within a three mile radius. They ordered a raid for the entire three mile radius and they found one home in a, um, in a farm and they found the Al-Qaeda leader of Zarqawi mm. and they captured them. Yeah, it so, was so through it's, SIM it's through, through SIM cards and through... Uh, tower triangulation. Yeah. It was, uh, this is how they captured them. 
So you always see in like 24 or these like spy thrillers, the guys like take out their sim and crush it and <laughs> throw it out and you know? Yes. That's why if you're gonna do, do any mischief, you get a, what is it, what are they called? The uh, burn, burner, right? A burner phone where you just, yeah. quick. So if you, did you try, yeah, so, so yeah. basically this was an example I, I created and, and a Robinson disaster reporting system where you send a, a trigger word to this alert system um, and it assesses your status using five or six text messages, right? And so just to give you a sense, again, over the past five years, how much things have progressed, I, I would encourage you guys to, to go to this website, textit.in, because every one of you, and we're actually gonna do a workshop uh, later, later in the year, um, training people on, on Textitin, and we've done that in a few classes, but every single one of you can build, I would say in a span of 30 minutes, a uh, reporting system, emergency reporting system, uh, a campaign system, all of the robocalls, and all of the text message alert systems that, that you have been subjected to for evil, you can turn that skill around and use it for good because this is a very, very straightforward thing. UNICEF actually bought this technology now and has made it available widely for a very low cost um, because of its ease of use. So it's a very, very powerful tool that you would have had to pay tens of thousands of dollars for in the past, but now uh, we're using it in Bangladesh for birth notification. So when a baby is born in a community, they send the word birth to a fixed number that we've developed. Um, and so actually they send the word BN, which is even easier to, to send in. Question? Okay, sorry, I thought you were raising your hand. Um, so let's look at a few case studies, right? So, so the first use case I wanna highlight is really comes out of the Ebola crisis in uh, West Africa. And this was a technology that was developed with, again, as Paul pointed out, when you have these different innovations working in isolation, you often get a fragmented solution that doesn't work smoothly. Um, and Hero was an example of four different companies coming together and merging their solution to really test the fact that it was uh, interoperable, both with their own systems, but with the national um, uh, demographic and health information uh, system. And so they were able to, to, to set up these kind of text bots, um, sort of like the Cortland uh, emergency system. But uh, in this case, it was to assess you know, stock levels of PPE and other personal protective equipment and other uh, essential uh, commodities that were required during this, uh, this epidemic. The, the software package is a lot more sophisticated because it allows you to track the workforce that you have in a given uh, emergency setting. So it's now being used by the Ministry of Health in uh, Liberia and a number of other countries, but to both track the workers that you have available, importantly and unfortunately, their vital status, right? Are they, are they still with you or not? Because one of the, the biggest case fatality rates during the Ebola crisis was in the actual health workforce who were engaging with patients um, right up front. Um, tracking the workforce's training levels and qualifications. As people become more and more trained, you can allocate them to different responsibilities within the system. And then, post-in-service uh, post training, where you can send them, um, post-pre-service training, you can send them in-service messages to reinforce the things that they've learned uh, on site, and then uh, to look at uh, you know, uh, different incoming classes of, of staff. But uh, this is a report that just came out, and for those of you who are interested in uh, either uh, the Ebola crisis or the response to this, I would strongly recommend uh, you, you download this report from uh, USAID. Sorry, I saw a hand, yeah. Um, all these messages, do you give them in local languages or how do you do them? You can do them in local languages, you can record them with a voice, you can write them in the script of the local language, whether it's uh, you know, Urdu or Arabic or Bangla, um, and you can send them uh, that way as well. But uh, you know, the, the, the bottom line here was that they, during the Ebola crisis, um, in the later phases, when some of these connectivity issues were, were, were identified, they used mHero for over three dozen use cases during the response and recovery phase, um, which, was, which was actually quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, but one of the ways they, they actually used the most was getting frontline workers 
to communicate back to the health system, a way of centrally aggregating feedback from those uh, frontline uh, disease warriors and, and understanding their needs and, and how to respond to those. So here's a, a quick snapshot from the report that I thought was really, really neat. And there, you know, in addition to these tools like uh, Iris and MHERO, you can see that they also did exactly what you guys did in the simulation, which is create a WhatsApp uh, group amongst health workers to share frustrations, challenges, and responses to uh, these various crises as they were taking place. Another use case example, Telecom Sans Frontier. Some of you have heard of Medsan Sans Frontier. This is their uh, you know, not so famous uh, smaller brother. Um, and what they do is they intervene during uh, humanitarian emergencies, much like uh, Paul was suggesting, to come up and set up a communications network or at least emergency communications uh, points for organizations that don't have a sat phone or don't have access to uh, that kind of capacity. One of the interesting things they did, and again, think about that, that bullet point of dignity, right? In an uh, emergency where you don't have uh, cell phone reception, if there was a place you could go and maybe stand in line for two hours and get a three minute call to let people know that you're okay, that you're alive, that, that you, know, you need X, Y, and Z, that is a very powerful tool. So they actually do this civilian calling program. We, we had that, and uh, we used to get a three minutes, and uh, we used to pay, I think, uh, 1,000 dinar for a minute, which mm. went to a dollar at that time. Neat. And, uh, so you actually use that, that yeah, service? Yeah, tons of kiosks opened, and uh, there's like the market, some will say it's a one dollar, some will say it's 70 cents, some mm -hmm. will say mm -hmm. 80 cents, and, um, and they will have to dial for you, Right. Because they will, they want to know which code you are dialing. For. Right, 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 right. Because maybe you are dialing for uh, an expensive. Uh, no, it could be a coordinate for a car bomb. Ah, jeez. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's no yeah. privacy at all. Right, right. They will listen to everything you say. Uh, so it was a very um, right. But you had, you had that capacity to call should you need. I mean, again, so it's a trade-off, right? Is it the perfect? you know, private one-on-one -on -one communication? Maybe not, but it's also giving you that, that access. Um, in the 2008, the Sichuan earthquake, you know, this was a, a very devastating earthquake. Uh, some of you may remember it, but, you know, 80,000 deaths occurred, five million people uh, left homeless, and they developed a mobile uh, emergency reporting system. Um, one of the things that is in the literature. So you, 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 if you start digging through PubMed, and I'd, I'd encourage you guys to, to look at the kinds of things that have emerged, because those of you looking for master's topics or doctoral topics, this is a ripe area to actually publish and, and do research on. But they had actually created, uh, they had had a, a cell phone company provide these phones that, that solved a major hurdle, right? Again, in this, this, this trough of disillusionment, on the back of the phone was a solar panel, right? So your phone's running out, you flip it over, and you charge it in the sun, and then you, you charge it back. And, uh, and then you have access to the, the, the phone again. So why don't we have that? I mean, it seems like such a no-brainer, but of course, you know, in China, you, have, you can buy those on the market. Um, they used SMS-based reporting. They had 16 different categories of information. The text messages were encrypted, and it took about two to three minutes per case report in this particular situation. But they had, as a result of this, real-time mapped reporting about what was happening on the ground. One of my favorite uh, examples of, of leveraging technology and is, is the one in Haiti, right? The, the major uh, earthquake in January of 2010. Was anyone in the room involved in the Haiti uh, earthquake response? Somewhat? Were you part of this? I mean, this? I so okay. but a doctoral student did a lot in this, in this thing. And, and it's actually quite exciting to see how very small scale innovation took center stage to, to serve as a coordinating mechanism during this crisis. In 12 hours, he and, he and colleagues at Tufts put together a, uh, a reporting system that then uh, one of our friends, uh, Josh Nesbitt, connected to his text messaging platform where they were able to set up a, a reporting line, 4636, to, to allow people to report um, what was happening on the ground. Open text, free text, just like you would send a tweet or like you would send a text message, just write the words 
and they had vans ri driving around uh, the town broadcasting, you know, if, if you need help or if you're trapped in a building uh, and, and you have, uh, your phone is working, send information to 4636. And they had an army of volunteers in the, in the Haitian diaspora manning these stations, looking through these messages, translating the messages, and putting coordinates on a, on a geomap of where, where different things were happening. Um, and you had categories of fire, trapped individuals, illnesses, vulnerable persons, et cetera. But you know, this is what, what Josh says, but, but you know, maybe it's true. But they claim that it really became a central coordinating uh, tool for these big, big hitters that came in uh, wanting information and wanting to respond, but they didn't have access to that information. And so this is what uh, it looked like, and I think it's still up on, online to see as a historical archive. But you can start to see the number, the volume of messages coming in, right, about these things. Now, again, the caveat, mind the gap, right? There may have been a lot of people suffering here just without access to, the f to uh, connectivity and unable to send a message. Um, but is that a reason not to do it? Because sure, of, uh, sure a lot of information did come through um, using these systems. So something to think so about. Quick yeah. historical footnote. But, well, actually, your slides going to say that. So Ushahidi is a Somali word for witness. And they actually developed that software in Kenya to map um, Oh, just me, or do I sing that? Strangers now? in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know, though. Um, to, to map these events, uh, and then the software has evolved. There's actually, we've had Ujahidi come and speak with us. It's an NGO. Uh, so and, and I think you did a couple of exercises one year. Yeah, we, we, we used it one year to. to uh, so it's yet another tool that's become kind of an industry standard. It's called crisis mapping. And, and you get these event reports. Sometimes you need curating, uh, somebody to make sure you tease out the sort of misinformation. Sometimes there's malinformation, people trying to sort of over-report event or maybe stifle some sort of information. But, but again, that's, that's the, the foundation sort of work was done in Kenya um, by Ushahidi. Yeah. So, so again, I, I, there, there's, you know, this, is, this, this space has grown so much in the past five years, we could probably do three lectures on the topic or even a, a certificate, um, really getting you guys trained up in these skills. So maybe that's something we'll, we'll work towards in future years. Um, so HESPER as as assessments, another way in which, you know, uh, in, a, in an emergency situation to rapidly assess the needs of, uh, of the population at, at risk. And, you know, these, these, uh, these short questions can be administered shortening that, that time frame from designing the survey, deploying it, and, and actually making decisions based on, on, on data as opposed to uh, non-empirical evidence. And you can actually set up, uh, how many of you have used uh, Open Data Kit, ODK, or Kobo Toolbox, or Magpie? So a few hands, right? But, but hopefully this number will go up quite a bit. But these are all simple examples of, of free or very inexpensive data collection tools that can be used on smartphones, dumb phones, feature phones, you name it. Um, so just thinking through some of the challenges, right? We've talked about uh, the availability of connectivity, but also think about what kinds of technologies may be available locally, or how much do you have to bring in in order to mount your response? And that, that may be a, a rate limiting step. Um, Paul and others have brought up this issue of damaged infrastructure. Also think about limited bandwidth, right? In Liberia, when I was out there a few weeks ago, we were still working on VSATs. How many of you know what a, have, have seen a VSAT? These ground-based, Kate, you've surely seen a, a VSAT. It's these big satellite dishes you see out in the field um, that you know, look like, look like uh, you know, the granddaddy of, uh, of these uh, TV, direct TV dishes, right? Um, but you pay $1,000 a month for connectivity that was like a dial-up modem several years ago. So you know, to get one email may take you, uh, you know, a half hour. So, so the, the bandwidth accessibility is extremely low. We'll talk a little bit about infrastructure. And this is really where I want to, to emphasize, you know, as we learn more on that crisis life cycle, realizing that investing in the capacity of a population to be resilient to these kinds of, uh, of disasters and have the infrastructure and infrastructure to be able to 
um, deploy these solutions when uh, uh, a crisis happens is, is really critical. And then as, as Court just nicely summed up, this issue, the, the risk of misreporting, right? Having incorrect information come through and how are you going to triage what's true and what's, what's not true? And you know, one report that's also came out in 2014 from USAID and a NetHope was a, a very, and, and this is rare to see a donor agency actually put out a report that says, well, this didn't work and this didn't work and this was crap and this was, you know, and, and, and they actually did that. They talked about, you know, uh, this remains nascent and is a limit, limiting factor in controlling and containing the epidemic because we, we didn't have uh, identification, um, case identification information systems. Network connectivity was poor. Planning and coordination across these different technologies was very bad because you had uh, a range of, of technologies that didn't talk to each other. I love this sentence introduced a plethora of tools. The, the global health community has introduced a plethora, it's a great SAT word, of uh, ICT tools, systems, and platforms without protocols for coordinating and data sharing, right? Um, they, they did like Ushahidi, which was, which was a tried and tested solution. So Ushahidi, at the point of time when, when uh, you know, the Ebola crisis happened, was over here. Because it had been through its sort of peak and trough around the time of, uh, of the Haitian uh, crisis and the Kenya election. So a lot of the kinks had been, been worked out. And then uh, their final thing is, you know, the, the use of these tools is limited by connectivity uh, as well as, uh, as con contamination. Now, what do they mean by contamination? Not, not data contamination, but actual real contamination, right? When you're in a, when you're in a Ebola treatment area, this was one of the biggest challenges, right? May I borrow your, your laptop? So let, let me just imagine this is a tablet, right? And I'm in my, in my PPEs, and now I've done all this, I've treated a patient, I've gone back to this. This is a vector, right? A, a vehicle for that, that iatrogenic transmission of, of, uh, of the, uh, the virus. And so sterilizing devices was a huge challenge. And actually, um, Google came up with a really neat, you're getting very scared as I'm like <laughs> tossing this around. Watch this. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they came up with a really cool um, plexiglass cover that you could place the iPad into or the, the tablet into and actually fully immerse the plexiglass into a sterilizing solution and while keeping the, the iPad safe but also responsive to touch. So um, thank you for sacrificing your... <laughs> but here's a, a beautiful example, right? You see where connectivity was and you see in the red triangles where the clinics were. Right? So mind the gap. Here we see a huge gap right? in terms of availability of connectivity where it was needed the most. And when you look at sort of the same map, right? so this is the, the connectivity cycle. Here you see Sierra Leone and Liberia. You see the, the zones of highest potential risk for emerging, emerging disease where we've got zero coverage in order to allow early case finding and case, case reporting, unless you come up with a system where you're offline capturing data and then going to a place where you have a connection. And actually, I went to a, a project in uh, Tanzania where part of the daily ritual, the workers would go through the community and capture data, and then at the end of the day, they had a little basket at the bottom, and I, I'm not making this up, the basket at the bottom of the coconut tree, and you would put the phone in the basket, and then you would you'd pull it up to the top of the tree and, and, and wait a few minutes and you'd hear doot, doot, and then it would come back down. It would send the text messages, but it couldn't do it from the ground. It had to be up where it had a, a taller line of flight. But this is the genius stuff that nobody sat in Baltimore and came up with. This was local ingenuity that they had come up with, not for disease reporting, but for, and, you know, for their day to day, because we would see all these phones. We're like, how do you get text messages, right? Like we use the coconut tree. Like, ah, well, we should use the coconut tree. Right? So that's the kind of, of innovation we want to be thinking about. And then there's also big data that's coming out from this stuff. And this is, this is really cool stuff. This is uh, Carolyn Bucky at, at Harvard. And now folks here at Hopkins are also doing this. But this is what we call um, cell data records, CDR. Not looking at the phone call, not looking at the phone numbers, just looking at the signature of the connection between a phone and the tower. 
right? And starting to see population movement around these various areas just as you track phones. So ignoring the highway systems or the, the dysfunctional road networks, you can actually look at this and understand where, where these crossing points may be from one population to another because behind these lines, the phones aren't just flying around themselves, they're being transported by people who have the phone in their pockets. And so you can actually proxy these human migration lines using phone um, issues. The other thing we talked about a little bit, infrastructure, right? So when you start understanding how information flows through a community, you're often faced with this kind of uh, real situation, right? Um, people who work in ergonomics often refer to this as work as it is, not work as it is imagined, right? And so you see this work as it is, and it's a very, very hectic way of, you know, Nelson calls Luke, Luke calls this guy, this guy sends information here. And systematically thinking through how information can be ideally transferred and improving those, uh, those uh, communications architectures is actually part of the, the prepared, investing in the preparedness phase um, for uh, these kinds of uh, emergencies. Um, a few unique challenges. We talked about identity, right? And in many cases, revealing your identity or even revealing data that may be on your phone puts you at great risk. And so there are technologies that allow you to actually have identity-free phones. If you have an iPhone, right? How many of you knew that you can wipe your iPhone clean after when, you, when you lose it? Everyone, do you know that? So you can sit at your laptop and say, my phone's, go to, go to iPhone, uh, findmyphone.com or something, and then actually just say, my phone's been stolen, I wanna wipe it clean. And the next time it connects to a network, based on its identity signature, it will delete itself. Android phones can also, can also do that. So if you had a Galaxy phone, you could also have to make it explode. <laughs> Give it a little more dramatic, uh, dramatic flair. But yeah, I mean, certainly, and so there are new technologies coming up in terms of um, uh, blockchain, which uh, hopefully next year we'll do a lecture on blockchain. But um, really, it's a, it's a new disruptive technology that allows you to secure data in much more, uh, in a much, much deeper sense than just encrypting data. You, you make data distributed and stored widely, which really limits the ability to, 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 um, to violate the integrity of that data once it's been stored in a, in a blockchain network. Um, if you're interested in blockchain, I've included a link here, a really nice report about um, technology for human development. Um, I'll just, I just wanna zoom ahead really quickly to I was gonna give you a few examples, but um, I'll just talk a little bit about, about drone technology. And there's a link here which um, I, I recommend you guys look at. It's a, it's a company called Zipline that's using drones to deliver blood, spe blood specimens in, um, in Rwanda. But really this technology now has been, has, UNICEF has been one of the biggest early adopters of, of drone technologies, really pushing drones to, uh, to the limits of how they're used. And you know, there's press releases coming out about the Malawi drone corridor, the Rwanda drone corridor, where they're testing a lot of these new innovations. And here's your, you know, I promised uh, Court I would freak everyone out, but I'm not gonna fly it, because we lost a student a few years ago. And, uh, <laughs> rest his soul. Um, but you know, delivering things, uh, routine deliveries, a, a drone, which, which like the one that Zipline uses, can do something like 30, 30 miles with about a two kilogram payload. So that's quite a distance to send products or specimens. UNICEF is using it for the turnaround of HIV um, tests on, on, uh, on neonates. So you do a, a, a heel stick and you send in the blood and then it gets tested and you can get results very quickly um, once the blood specimen is, is transferred. But the report that I, that I showed you just a minute ago, this, um, this Drones in Humanitarian Action, um, really pulled together a, a nice series of case studies looking at how uh, drones were really being used in a, in, in, in across this entire cycle from the assessment to the response phase of uh, humanitarian emergencies. And you know, this is one kind of drone right here. This is a, a, a commercial drone that has a high resolution camera that's following you guys, you see as it. But, but 
This is the kind of drone you would use to map an emergency, a disaster zone. Um, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that really quickly. You can set this on autonomous mode and have the drone fly over a disaster, creating uh, what's called an ortho mosaic, so a, a stitched together map of uh, the area. This is an example of the Google Earth kind of technology that we have available. And this is an example of, you can almost read the license plate, um, what's taken with a, with a drone. But again, this is available to anyone in this class that you, you now have this technology within your reach to conduct uh, this kind of operations. But you can take that imagery, and I think this is also what's exciting using uh, the Google and uh, Gates Foundation together are building these um, AI models to actually extract what they call micro censuses. So looking at um, spatial artifacts, right? So you're able to recognize different kinds of, of uh, geospatial artifacts and then create from that estimators of population that then gives you a denominator. And that is the sacred golden calf that all public health people are always looking for. How can we get a denominator on this? And so this technology now brings us one step uh, closer to that. Um, and so with, with denominators, you can do micro plans and you can start to really improve coverage in these kinds of uh, situations. And the last thing I'll, I'll leave you guys with is, is really um, using this technology to build awareness and empathy. And so um, this is a simple uh, Google Cardboard, right? How, how many of you have had your, put your hands on one of these? So I see a few people, but you know, 10 bucks, you get one of these, you stick your phone into this, and now you're a fully immersed three-dimensional uh, space. And so the, the UNHCR and other groups have used this heavily to build empathy about the, the refugee uh, situation in Syria. And so you're able to uh, put these headsets on and your sound video 360 degree immersed into that environment um, to give you a sense of, here's Ban Ki-moon wearing one of them, um, but to give you a sense of full immersion. And actually, you know, even, even if you want to, to watch a video on the airplane and you don't want people looking over your shoulder, stick one of these on your head and you be proud of the geek that you are. Um, but this, this gives you another sort of potential that's a very low hanging fruit and Paul and I are, are co-conspiring around you know, bringing this to the classroom. So maybe in a subsequent year we'll actually put headsets on everyone and have you um, be taken to the place that we, uh, we want to try to show you. Um, so I'll end with this slide and just say that for every solution, for every sort of problem that you tackle, there's an appropriate solution, and not every solution is appropriate for the, uh, the space that you're working in. And so there's a lot of different uh, questions that you have to, to wrestle with. Um, you have to think about power, uh, backups, uh, confidentiality, security, and cost. And so I think uh, hopefully you'll take away with you that there's a multitude of uh, solutions and you have to really think through the appropriateness of that solution. Um, and the line between vaporware and hardware is rapidly dissolving. And so um, I found that you can, if you can dream it up, there's probably someone out there who has created something to enable you to do that in, in the real world. So hopefully you guys will be the, the content of future lectures like this. But thanks so much, it's a real pleasure.